yeah, like one. You're looking to play one plus not p, sorry, one plus x to the. That's the general form, right? Now, that x can be anything you want because you can always substitute something else in for x. That's just a placeholder. But what's the thing you really, really have to have? What's the structural thing here that you must have, Nate? We talked about this about 30 minutes ago. So a, one a one. You really got to have that one. You have to have that one. See that one, everybody? It's kind of important. Okay. <laughs> then you're sub. Then you would substitute negative x once you get the pa once you do. You, you, then you would substitute negative x into what the expansion is. So you do the whole thing and then substitute. Correct. Yes. Correct. So for this one, you actually have to do some algebraic manipulation first. They nicely have it as a squared. So what are you going to pull out of the bottom? A. And what does that leave you with on the inside? What's it leave you with on the inside if you factor one that out? Plus mx over a. One plus x squared over a squared. a squared. Exactly. What nicely cancels, Sujong? A. A cancels. So you're left with a over the square root of 1 plus x over a squared. 1. Did I do it wrong? Oh, then I left the a. Thank you. It's a weird day for me in writing. I was writing things last class. I'd be like, the number 2. <laughs> did that several times. Okay. So now, what does that equal? That equals... 1 plus x over a squared all to the what power? Negative 1 half. So you use the formula. What was that formula for this one? It was 1 plus px plus what? p times 1 over 2 factorial plus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 over what? x, yeah. The x squared and the x cubed, right? Goes on? So for this one, in this case, what does p equal? Negative one half. And in this case, what does our you know what does our x equal? X over a squared. So you're just doing a substitution on this. So what is this going to look like? It always starts with what? One. one. So then it's going to be one minus one half of x over a what? Squared. Squared, because you're substituting x over a squared in for x. It seems kind of causally not possible, like some sort of like paradox. That's why usually it'd be nice if we instead. I, I hate using x in formulas. It'd be nice if it was like q or y. You understand what I'm saying, everybody? Kinda, maybe. So what's the next one going to be? It's going to be plus negative one half, right? Times what? Negative three halves all over two factorial x over a what? To the squared. Squared. I'm just writing it out the general way. I'm not. I'm not cleaning anything up yet. How how many terms do I need to go to? Four of them. So we need one more. This is going to be plus negative a half times what? Negative three halves times negative five halves all over what? Three. Times x over a. Oh, not two. See, I'm saying something and writing something else. X over a squared to the what power? Third. And that becomes to the six. Now, can you clean this up? Yeah. Yes, you can clean this up, absolutely. But that's what you that would be really the guts of what I'm looking for. If you were to write that down, you would get almost all of the credit. Would I expect you to not have compound fractions in your answer? Or not have fractions inside fractions? Yeah, I would expect you to simplify that a little bit. Does it work out kind of nice? Yeah, it works out kind of nice. What yes. Is it, uh, is it? How do you go about doing this? How do you go about doing this? Yeah, Matt. Find the Taylor series and then what do you do? Add them together. So what is e to the x? 1 plus? Or is it x? It's 1. Does it start with 1? Okay. 1 plus x plus over plus x cubed over. Oh, does it just keep on going like this? So what is e to the negative x going to be? 1 and then plus x squared over 2 factorial minus x cubed over plus x to the fourth over like that so when you add them together what happens so e to the x plus e to the negative x do a lot of things cancel yeah what cancels all the odds right so you're left with 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the oh two of them sorry two of them you're absolutely right 
two. It starts with two, yes. So two plus, let's be just two times, one plus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial plus x to the sixth over six factorial, like that. So we distribute it in and end up with two plus x squared plus x to the fourth over what? Twelve. Twelve. How far do we have to go? First three? Do we have the first three non-zero terms? Yay! We have the first three non-zero terms. What's wrong, Umi? Did we do something wrong? Why is it going to look like a parabola? Yeah. All the terms are two. All. Well, more specifically, it's it's you can be more specific than that. When you zoom way out on a polynomial, what's the only term that really is going to affect what it looks like? The highest power. And in this case, the highest power is always what? Is always what? Even. Always even, exactly. You could have other odd powers. You could have odd powers in here, but if the highest power is even, what's it going to look like if you zoom really far out? It's going to look like the even power. Do you remember how that works with n behavior, everybody? The limits as n goes continue. Really, only the highest power really matters. That's what it looks like when you zoom out. So because the highest power is always even, it will look like a parabola. Does that make sense? Yeah? You with me? Yeah, what's it say? Here's what you did, kids. You just... Kids, kids. Paying attention here. Kids. Yes. You just showed that e to the theta i was equal to cosine theta. Oh, is it not? Yeah, I got to unfreeze it again. Sorry. Plus what? I sine theta. Kind of cool. Did it did it work out for you? Did the things mesh up? Like you can show it by like taking it apart or putting them together. But it kind of miraculously. I mean, you, you kind of suspected it at the beginning because when you looked at the original terms, you had e odds and evens, and you put, eh, maybe something e. like that, right? Here's what's really, really awesome about this, which is let theta equal pi. E to the pi i is therefore going to equal cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. What's cosine of pi? 1. What's sine of pi? Oh, look at this. E to the pi i is equal to 1. No. Cosine of pi is... What's cosine of pi? It's negative one, sorry. <laughs> Whoops! Whoops! <laughs> sorry. Excuse me, I was like, reality broken? No! We're inside a black hole looking out upon another black hole. Reality broken. So yeah, check it, take a look at that. So you usually see that rewritten as e to the pi i plus one is equal to zero. And now you have proven what I showed you in assembly. You have now proven Euler's formula and applied a really cool result of Euler's formula, which is that you have some irrational numbers mixing in some imaginary numbers, adding one to it and getting zero. You have the ad additive identity, you have the multiplicative identity, you've got irrationality, you've got exponents, and it all comes together. If you ask, your calculator, well actually, what happened when you tried it on your calculator? Yeah, so some, cal if some versions of the operating system can deal with this and some can't. Um, the coolest thing about this that I feel is that it is the coolest thing in all of mathematics. And I think you could quantifiably measure that. If you went around the world and asked a thousand mathematicians, what are the five coolest things you've ever seen in math? I would imagine that the majority of them would either put this first or in the top five easily. It don't get much cooler than that. Look how elegant that is. That is ridiculous. Yes. See, is the measure of the coolest Found it. What we look at next is weird because you have not really seen stuff this strange before. Notationally, notationally, it's way over here in terms of what you need to do with it. Really simple mathematics in terms of the math you need to actually do. But understanding what you need to do, there's a huge, huge bridge that we need to build. Who watched the video last night? You watched the video? Did it kind of, sort of make, did, did it teach you anything? Maybe a little bit, maybe? Maybe a little bit? So, it's, it's difficult to follow, but that's the thing. There is no way for me to go like one path and have you understand each step at 100%. This is the kind of thing you have to look at and look at and look at, and it makes more sense each time. So here's pass number two. You've had pass number one last night. Here's pass number two. 
you've seen this before, which was the error bound of an alternating series. And this was blah, 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 but it comes down to, if you want to know how accurate you are with your current guess, the maximum error is equal to the next term in the alternating series. So for example, if you were to add one plus a half, so one plus a half minus a third, plus a fourth minus a fifth, the alternating what? What's that called? The alternating harmonic. harmonic. If you want to know how accurate you are, you just find the next term. Do you remember that, everybody? The yeah. accuracy of where you are with an alternating series is within the absolute value of the next term. Do you kind of remember that? It's actually not super different when you look at this. This looks awful, and there is a lot to unpack on this. And in the video, I actually prove this for you. And it really results, the core of the proof, two facts that you already know. First, if you have an n degree polynomial and you take the derivative n plus one time, what do you have? If you have a polynomial to the nth degree and you take the derivative n plus one times, what number do you have? Zero. Zero. What's the third derivative of x squared? Zero. What's the second derivative of x? Zero. What's the nth plus one derivative of any n degree polynomial? Zero. Zero. So that's the first thing you need to understand in order to understand that. The second thing was if we get rid of a lot of stuff by taking derivatives repeatedly and we get to the nth plus one derivative, if I want to not have derivatives, what's the process of undoing derivatives called? What's one, one two, three, Integration. So that proof takes a bunch of derivatives to obliterate a bunch of stuff and then it starts integrating. It starts integrating. That's where this n plus one factorial comes from. When you integrate something n plus one times, you're going to see that. You're going to see that, like, when you take the integral of x, what do you get? One half x squared, right? When you integrate it, plus c, right? We get to we get to get rid of those constants because we're taking derivatives a bunch of times. If you integrate again, if you integrate one half x squared, it goes to x cubed, right? But what do you have to plug down? Oh, a three has to go down there, so it's one over three times two, and then it's one over four times three times two. So that's where the factorial comes from. It's the repeated n plus one integration of this inequality that it sets up for you. So this is the error bound, the maximum error bound right here. The maximum error bound right there. And that the error is the difference between what does PNX represent? That's the, the Taylor polynomial of degree what? N. As the degree gets higher, what happens to the accuracy? It gets bigger, right? I mean, sorry, the accuracy gets better, not bigger. The accuracy gets better, which what an f of x represents the actual function, right? So what happens as n gets greater? Theoretically, this gets what? Smaller. The gap between the actual and the estimate gets smaller. In this, in this, you should recognize all the pieces. I do I rec do I require that you do the proof by yourself? Like, am I going to ever have you prove this on a test? Absolutely not. But do you need to understand what all these pieces mean? Absolutely. So do you understand what the n is? That's the degree of the Taylor polynomial, right? That's the degree you're going to. A is where you are what? Using the C. Near, centered. It's where you're centered, right? Remember, we like centering things around zero, but are we always centered around zero? No, so we could be centered around somewhere else, right? And again, so essentially, understanding this proof, come all of it comes down to which letter, though? M. M. It comes down to M. The proof starts off. What does this mean? F n plus one here. What does that mean? The n plus one derivative of f. F is not bound, is not an n degree polynomial. F, f could be going on forever, right? It could be huge. It's it's still around when you take the n plus one derivative. The point being, M is the smallest number you can find that you know is greater than this. There's no other way for me to say that. We're going to practice it in a second. M is the smallest number we can find that is definitely greater than this on a specific interval. At this point, you might be thinking, what the heck does that mean? What practical application does it have even inside this really weird topic? And that's where you stay standing. I want you to actually really soak this in. So you have a lot of text here. And this is some of the text that I went through in the proof. I'm not going over the text of the proof. I want to do this question right here. It says, give a bound on the error, meaning what's the maximum error? That's essentially what it's saying. What's the maximum error when e to the x is approximated by its fourth degree Taylor polynomial on that interval? So first of all, can you write me, if you wanted to, the Taylor polynomial for, for uh, e to the x? 
you should be able to. It's got to be automatic. And what's that going to be? It's going to be e to the x, right? 1 plus what? Plus. 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 That's the fourth degree Taylor polynomial. So what we're doing is between negative 0.5 and 0.5, what's the maximum error that this polynomial, this estimation could have? I mean, what's the farthest away from the actual value it could be? Now, if we had a calculator and we could deal with the actual e to the x, could we figure that out just using a calculator? Yes. But the point is, we're trying to use these methods when we don't, when we can't evaluate the actual function. Yes, Matt? What if it be 0.5 instead of the actual Part of that's part of it exactly. So what was that statement? You remember how you remember how, remember how you had to remember cn? You have to remember this thing. It was over n plus one factorial x minus a to the n plus one, and what goes on top? M. Everything except for m is just plug and chug. That's it. So what what do we need to plug in for n? Four. Okay, so we have m over five factorial, and what are we centered around? Zero. So this is just going to be x minus zero to the what? Five. Well, x minus zero in the absolute value. X, x, so we to the fifth power, we have this thing. So we have this now. This is our, our bound that we're looking for, but we're not done yet. To the what power? Five. We need to find what? M. We need to find that lowest upper bound. That's a term you will definitely use hundreds of times in your future math career, lowest upper bound. We want to find a number that is certainly greater than our target. And our target is this. Remember this written out up above? n plus 1 of x has to be less than or equal to m. But what's our interval we're dealing with? What's the interval for this problem? Negative 0.5 to 0.5. What's the original function we're dealing with? When we have? What function are we modeling? What's the derivative of e to the x? What's the derivative of that? So is this a nice one to have to do repeated derivatives of? So what I'm asking you for right now is, if I gave you this, e to the x right, right there, and you're looking at the interval from negative a half to positive a half, what's the biggest e to the x can be on that interval? On that interval? e to the what? e to the one half. Can anybody tell me why it has to be e to the one half? What type of function is e to the x? What does it look like? Use your arm. What's it look like? It's always what? It's always increasing. So if you want the maximum value of e to the x, where do you go? You go to the all the way to the right. So what's the all the way to the right value? One half. So what's the largest this can be on this interval? E to the half. So what does that tell us? Oh, we just found our m value. Where do we put that? So now we have e to the half over 5 factorial x to the fifth, meaning that is the maximum error of the function that we have at the Taylor polynomial of degree 4, remember the 4 degree Taylor polynomial, at an x value between negative 0.5 and 0.5. So with this formula, we can calculate the maximum error at a given x value. So the, the e to the x might go like this, and our polynomial might mirror it pretty well. This tells us the maximum error it could possibly be at every value between negative 0.5 and 0.5. Now, is it really nice that we have a function that has a derivative that is itself? Yes. Is it really nice that we have a function that just monotonically goes up? So therefore, if we want the greatest value, where do we go? To the right? Are those two things always going to be true? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> when we take derivatives, can they sometimes get nastier? Do we try to avoid having them totally blow up on our face? Yes. But is it pot? This is the cleanest derivative there is. Is it going to get worse? Yes, it is. Now, is the maximum always going to be an endpoint? How much time did you spend last year finding maximums and maximums of functions? That's like half of your existence last year, right? Finding maximums, right? So sometimes you're going to have to find a maximum using like the first derivative and stuff like that. Absolutely. Okay, sit down, everybody. Automatically for one. What are the values we definitely know? N is equal to what? Uh, uh, uh. Three. And what's A equal to? Zero. So take what it gives you. 
So it's going to be m over 4 factorial x minus 0 to the what power? 4. And you can clean this up a little bit. You're going to get m over 4 factorial, and it's just x to the fourth. Why did I get rid of the absolute value? It's an even power, exactly. So here's the deal. Our entire search, the last 10% is the search for m. So what do we have here? f to the what derivative are we taking? n plus 1. n was what? 3. 3, so it's f what? 4 of x. We're looking for some m value. What's our interval? Now this is where I got tripped up a little bit. I do get tripped up because it, did it state an interval on this? Do you see an interval that's stated? No. Go back to 10.1. If you ever get stuck like that, like I don't know what interval I'm looking at, look at the last line here. m on the interval between a and x. So what's our a value? Zero. On this question, where are we trying to go to? What value are we doing the estimate at? 0 0.1. So what interval are we looking for a maximum on? 0 to what? 0 0.1. What's the nice function we have, though? e to the what? e to the x. And if we take the derivative, what does it become? Yeah, and e to the x. So if we're looking for the max here in this case, what is m going to be? We know it's always increasing, so we take the value farthest to the right. So what's the maximum value? e to the 0 0.1. So where do we plug that in? We plug that in right there. So we have our maximum error is going to be e to the 0 0.1 all over x to the fourth. That would be the error bound function from 0 to 0.01. So if we wanted the actual maximum error at 0 0.1, what do we plug in for x? This, is, this gives us the error bound from all the x values from 0 to 0.1. So if we want to know what the actual maximum error is at 0 0.1, what are we plugging for x? 0 0.1. There's a lot of redundancy on the first ones of these, because what do they like to use? They like to use e to the x. So are we actually doing any differentiation? No. Is there any questing to find a maximum value? No. It's relatively straightforward. But be prepared, it's not always going to be straightforward. Divide that by, which is 4 factorial is 24. And then what do we multiply that? Now, here's the thing. All numbers are relative, right? So you might look at them, oh, that's the error. What do we still need to multiply by? Yes, 0 0.1 to the, to the fourth power. And what do we end up with? We get that thing right there. So this is the error that, this is the max error that we project it can be right here. And what does that equal decimal point wise? How many times do you have to move the, the decimal point? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is that, so overall, does that seem like a pretty good error bound? Hopefully. Maybe you need it to be better though. So this is our estimated error. How do we find the actual error bound of the function? How do we find the actual error bound? We need to actually, exactly, what's the actual error? Actual is going to be the function minus the, not equals, minus the what? The third degree, S, the Taylor series, right? So you have to be really careful when you plug this in. What's the actual function? It's e to the x minus, and what was our Taylor series expansion? We know what that is. It's 1 plus what? x plus over 2 factorial plus x cubed over what? 3 factorial. What do we, we, what do we plug in for here? We plug in x is equal to 0 0.1. This is our actual error. Do we, should they be relatively close together, our actual error and our, our estimated error? You would hope. You would hope they're in the same ballpark or we're doing something wrong. And they could, honestly, the biggest thing is like not going the right number of terms. In this case, the actual area is the actual function minus our estimate. And this is a shortcut. Like at this point, you see this right here? All this work right here. Did we need to calculate for any of this? No. Were we able to get a statement for this right here is the estimated error? Do we know what the decimal is? No. But were we able to find this without a calculator? 
That's really important to be able to do. Now, to compare actual to our estimate, you need a calculator, right? So it seems like it defeats the purpose a little bit. But the idea is we're now building faith in this process. That kind of makes sense a little bit. So tonight, you're only going to have to do a few of these. Just take it very slowly. Take it very, very slowly. What are they asking you to do? Keep on asking, what am I being asked to do? What am I being asked to do? Take it slowly. Okay, we are done.